Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 480th episode, we've got a new relative of the chicken from hell that lived alongside T-Rex. It also turns out there was a carnivorous acrocanthosaurus roaming all over what's now the U.S. And we've got an update on the Yale Peabody Museum, as well as our dinosaur of the day, Chow Yangsaurus. And our fun fact, I'll give you a hint. Why do some animal groups get small? I don't know. Well, you'll find out. Why do some of them get big? No, that's a whole other episode, I think. Why do some of them stay the same? (laughs) (laughs) I guess we're only going into one of them for the fun fact. But before we get into all of that, as always, we'd like to thank some of our patrons. And this week, again, we have 10 new patrons to thank. So we have Dom Likes Dinos, Pada, Dilophosaurob, Binder Clipchick, Tiffany, Kaylee, Ikasaurus, Will, Taylor, and another Will. Thank you all very much for joining us. Yes, thank you so much. We are blown away by the support that we got in January celebrating our nine-year anniversary of I Know Dino. Yes, and we'll be mailing out the Parasaurolophus patches shortly to all of our Triceratops and Up patrons. We didn't quite make the 300 paid patrons goal, so unfortunately we're not going to be sending out the Styracosaurus patch, but we are going to send out something else with the Parasaurolophus patch instead. Yes, so keep an eye out, and if you are a patron at the Triceratops tier and above, please make sure that your mailing address is up to date. Jumping into the news, I've got our new chicken from hell relative that lived alongside T-Rex that I teased earlier. And this paper was written by Kyle Atkins Weltman and others and published in PLOS One and it's open access so you can read all about it if you would like and see all the pictures. Back in 2014, There was a dinosaur named Anzu that was named. It was just before we started the podcast, and it was, I think, a major part of the first book that we, that Sabrina wrote with I Know Dino. It was definitely a part of it, yeah. I remember the chicken from hell part of it, and that was the nickname given to Anzu at the time. Mm -hmm. Although calling it a chicken is kind of funny because it was huge. (laughs) It would have been a huge chicken. Maybe... The chicken from hell part implies that it's huge because that's scarier. I don't know. It was also in the hell creek, so that's part of the hell part. So Anzu and this new dinosaur are oviraptorosaurs, also known as the quote-unquote egg thief dinosaurs. But probably not actual egg thieves. Yeah, they may not have ever actually stolen any eggs. Oviraptor was found on top of its own nest and falsely accused of eating them. J'accuse! <laughs> Oviraptorosaurs include Oviraptor, Caudipteryx, Gigantoraptor, Cedipotty, and Incisivosaurus, which is that last one is one of my favorites. Why? Well, it's got these crazy long teeth in the front of its mouth, thus the incisor part of the name. Most of the Oviraptorosaurs, especially the later ones, didn't have any teeth. But some of the early ones had teeth, especially in the very front of their mouth. And that one's just, some people compare it to a rodent with these really long teeth. It's just such a strange animal. But oviraptorosaurs are predominantly from Asia and North America and have only been found in the Cretaceous. And again, most of them have toothless beaks, although some of them did have teeth. Many oviraptorosaurs have a bony crest on the top of their head. And that means when you look at it from the side, their head profile looks a little bit like a pachycephalosaurus with the big bump on the top of the head. But if you look at it from the front, like straight on, it's much, much narrower. It's literally a crest, like almost like half a frisbee or something on the top of its head and not a big dome. It also doesn't have any spikes on the back of its head and has a shorter snout than Pachycephalosaurus. So its head shape in general is more like a shorter ornithomimosaur than it is like a Pachycephalosaur. Mm. Also kind of like an ostrich or something today, just a short little beaky head. That's how I think of ornithomimosaurs. Yes. Yeah, I think oviraptorosaurs have a sort of general similarity to ornithomimosaurs, like ornithomimus or gallimimus, except that a lot of the oviraptorosaurs have a more impressive head with that crest on it. And they're not that distant of relatives, the oviraptorosaurs and the ornithomimosaurs. 
Both groups have been found with evidence of feathers. And it reminds me of when you, Sabrina, were wearing the Oviraptor costume crouched on a nest oh, <laughs> at a yeah. museum. They had a little display where you could do that because they found quill knobs on the Oviraptorosaur forelimbs. So they think it probably had these big feathers sticking out. And they presume that if it sat on the nest the way that we've seen them fossilized, those feathers would have stuck out and covered the front of the nest. So they could have incubated the nest nicely or shielded them from heat, as the case may be. There's one other fun connection between Oviraptorosaurs and Ornithomimosaurs, and that comes down to what their names mean. Although not Ornithomimosaur, you got to go to a subset. So Anzu and this new dinosaur are actually both a subtype of Oviraptorosaur called Cenonathids or Canonathids. You may have guessed that's where we were going with this when we're talking about all the head crests, because that's what they're really famous for. Even though their name has to do with jaws? Yes. So Cenonathid means recent jaws because they're similar to ostriches and other paleonaths. But the funny thing about it is that paleonaths mean old jaws. Yeah, it's backwards. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the paleonaths, a lot of the ornithomimosaurs are named after paleonaths. So there's a lot of similarity between these animals and in, in the way their heads look. I guess it makes sense that if you see the same thing in the fossil record from 100 million years ago and something living today, that the thing today would be considered old and the thing 100 million years ago would be considered new because they're sort of similar to each other. But anyway, back to this new Oviraptorosaur slash Cenonathid, if you want to be specific. Its name is Eoneophron yeah. infernalis. It's got a nice ring to it. Eoneophron. Yeah. What's well, sort of... It's like Eoneophron is mm. kind of how you pronounce it. But yeah, it's spelled N-E-O. The genus name is, quote, derived from the ancient Greek Eo, meaning dawn, and from the genus name of the Egyptian vulture, which is Neophron, sometimes referred to as the pharaoh's chicken. <laughs> so it's like a before chicken. <laughs> yes. And then Infernalis comes from, quote, Latin for hell in reference to the Hell Creek Formation. Together, the taxon name equates to Pharaoh's Dawn Chicken from Hell, end quote. So Eoneophron is the Pharaoh's Chicken from Hell. And it's also named after the lead author's previous pet, which was a monitor lizard named Pharaoh. Ooh, so many connections. And then it also connects to Anzu, its close relative, which is the chicken from hell. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> there's a lot of things. At first, I was worried when I read this that they had just named it chicken from hell. And I was thinking, oh, no, we've been calling Anzu the chicken from hell forever. And I don't know if I can change that. Forever. <laughs> <laughs> For 10 years, the whole podcast. Yeah. I was going to say... Forever means something different to people who are into dinosaurs. Yes. Well, I mean, like, as long as we've known Anzu. <laughs> yeah. And it would be really tricky if they named this one just Chicken from Hell. And now every time we said it, we'd have to think like, oh, wait, which one is it? Is it Eoneophron or is it Anzu? But fortunately, this one is the Pharaoh's Chicken from Hell and not just Chicken from Hell. And it's the Dawn Chickens before chickens. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> So Eoneophron was found in Meade County, South Dakota. I'm not sure exactly how it was found, but they said there's some rock attached to it, which resembles the Hell Creek. So they're pretty sure it's from the Hell Creek. And since it was found in the Hell Creek, just like Anzu, that means it would have lived with T-Rex. Interestingly, when the authors were first looking at it, they assumed that the bones were from Anzu, but like a juvenile Anzu because it was younger or smaller and presumably younger. Except not, it's older. Like it lived in time before? No, I think they coexisted because they're both in the Hell Creek. Oh, you're right, never mind. Yeah, that's true though, because a lot of times when they do Dawn in a name, it means that it came before the thing that has a similar name. Mm -hmm. I guess they just did Dawn because it's way before Neophron, the... The vulture. Yeah, the vulture that lives today. Obviously, they ended up naming a new dinosaur, so clearly they think this is a new animal and not just... A baby Anzu. Unfortunately, they didn't find the skull, so we don't know if it had the head crest. Mm. But they did find a partial hind limb, specifically the right femur, right tibia, the astragalocalcaneum, which is a couple of ankle bones fused together, a right metatarsal three, and a right metatarsal four, which are both foot bones. Again, the bones are smaller than Anzu, but Anzu was pretty big. Anzu was tall enough it could look you in the face 
and was about 12 feet or three and a half meters long. Terrifying. Which, again, they named it after a chicken or nicknamed it after a chicken, which is just funny for something that's 12 feet long. A chicken <laughs> that was that big would be scary. Yes, it would be. It would be incredibly terrifying. And that's why Anzu is has the name that it has, which references like a, a demon, basically. So in order to determine whether Eoneophron was just a baby Anzu or if it was something new, they did a couple different things. They used the femur circumference to estimate its mass, and the femur was distorted, so they digitally, quote-unquote, retro-deformed it. Okay. <laughs> Meaning, to get an estimate of what it originally looked like. Yeah, yeah, just like retro-deforming, because it's like, it's just restoring. Mm -hmm. But anyway, they did the same thing with Anzu to get the comparison because they wanted to make sure this technique was working the way that they intended. And they found that the circumference of Eoneophron was about 106 millimeters or about four inches. And that gave an estimate of 58.9 to 98.1 kilograms or about 130 to 216 pounds. Still pretty big. Yeah, it's like roughly the range of human size. Although they always were bigger and tougher per weight since they had hollow bones and other adaptations. The middle estimate is about 78 kilograms or 172 pounds, which is a little bit less than a typical common ostrich. On the other hand, they estimated the Anzu holotype was between 202 and 342 kilograms or 445 to 754 pounds, which is similar to earlier estimates. And even on the light end, that would dwarf the largest ostriches. That's more like grizzly bear type hmm. size. It's a very impressive and terrifying animal, aptly named. They also did histology by cutting the bone and polishing it down until it was transparent and they could count the growth rings. Like a typical oviraptorosaur, the femur is mostly hollow, but they counted six lags in the remaining piece. The growth seems to have slowed quite a bit after the first two lags, so it might have been sexually mature at two years old, or maybe three if there's a lag missing from the hollow middle part of the bone. So it's fully grown. No, well, they called it as either a subadult or maybe adult oh. in their analysis, because even though the growth is slowing, it hadn't completely stopped growing yet. So it's not fully skeletally mature. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Even with it not being fully grown, though, the authors don't think it would have reached Anzu sizes or really even close to an Anzu size. Well, if it's already slowing down and it got to this size, that makes sense. Yeah, it did immediately because I was looking at all the histology of the nanotyrannus papers recently. It made me think about that comparison because when people looked at the histology of some of the nanotyrannus slash baby T-Rex specimens, they were saying, yeah, it's slowing down, but who cares? You know, like it could just be an anomaly. It could still grow way bigger, but nobody is saying that with this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's definitely a different level of evidence required for the nano tyrannus debate than other dinosaurs, which a lot of the critics have pointed out. But back to Eoneophron. The most important piece of evidence for it being its own genus is that they found some unique features in the bones. The astragalocalcaneum is fused to the tibia. So it's not just a couple of ankle bones fused together, those ankle bones themselves are fused to the tibia, in other words, the lower leg, which really gives a quite sturdy, inflexible leg. And I know sometimes that is an adaptation for moving more quickly, and more rigid legs can be helpful for that. They also found a unique ridge on a toe bone. So those were like the two autapomorphies or unique features that they named for Eoneophron. Phylogenetically, Eoneophron's closest relatives were found to be Cityphes and Elmosaurus. Cityphes lived about 10 million years before Eoneophron, but in the same place, roughly. And Elmosaurus lived about 4 million years earlier, so they're closer in time, but it was way over in Mongolia. Closer in time, but they still never would have met. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 4 million years is a, still a long time. There are so many of these things that in the latest Cretaceous were in both Asia and in North America. So Lore Asia, as it was called, mm -hmm. just so much back and forth, which is hard to imagine nowadays with how separated the continents are. It's a totally different time. Yeah. But a lot of times the sea level is higher. It's very strange. Anyway, so now we have Anzu and we have Eoneophron 
in the Hell Creek, but the authors think there might also be a third Cenanathid already discovered that hasn't been named yet. It's a good spot for Cenanathids. It is, yeah. They also included some paleo art of the three of them. It's got Anzu, Eoneophron, and an Oviraptorosaur, only known as MOR752 so far, which is significantly smaller. That one might actually be closer to a chicken size or maybe a turkey size. Well, now we know the Museum of the Rockies has it. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's what the MOR means. And in the paleo art, the Anzu is intimidating the other two away in this big display of aggression. And bigness. Yes. <laughs> the feathers help with the bigness display. <laughs> Large size. I, yeah. Yeah. I know what you're going for. Mm -hmm. One implication of that fact that there's at least two Cenanathids, maybe three in the Hell Creek, is that the diversity of the Cenanathids, quote, remained successful components of Laurasian ecosystems until the KPG extinction, end quote, which means Basically, across North American Asia, these Cenanathids were doing fine right up until the bitter end. And it's possibly another nail in the coffin of the dinosaurs were about to go extinct if it weren't for that pesky asteroid hypothesis. Okay, Scooby-Doo. Because <laughs> <laughs> I said pesky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't for that meddling asteroid. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. The more we look into it, it's like the more dinosaurs that get discovered the more it seems like they were doing fine. There were a lot of diversity still going on in the latest Cretaceous. There is a recency bias on this fossil record though, so it's not a done deal, but yeah. Now we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break, but when we get back, Sabrina's going to tell us about a new Acrocanthosaurus find. Well, as promised, there's been an Acrocanthosaurus definitively found in Maryland in the U.S. in the Arendelle Formation. This was published by Matthew Carano in Cretaceous Research. Now, this paper about Acrocanthosaurus is not about the large dinosaur that was reported on last October, and we mentioned on our show. We talked about it in episode 468. As far as I know, there's no scientific papers on that one just yet, but they do think it was likely the tibia of an Acrocanthosaurus, a leg bone. The bones described in this paper were found way back in 1992 in Dinosaur Park. They're fragmentary, but there's enough features to tell that it's Acrocanthosaurus. And it's the, quote, first well-founded record, end quote, of Acrocanthosaurus in eastern North America. Because Acrocanthosaurus is mostly known from Texas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. So this is quite a bit further east. Mm-hmm. Before, we only suspected Acrocanthosaurus was in places like Maryland based on teeth found. This new definitive Maryland Acrocanthosaurus is the smallest known Acrocanthosaurus. It's probably a subadult based on its size, some unfused bones, and they did histology on it. It's at least five to six years old. It was still growing when it died. There's one illustration that shows the estimated size compared to a full-grown Acrocanthosaurus, and it kind of looks like a baby following its mother because it fits right under the bigger one's tail, <laughs> and its whole body is about the length of the bigger one's tail. <laughs> now, Acrocanthosaurus was named in 1950 based on two partial skeletons found in Oklahoma, and it lived in the early Cretaceous. Its genus name means high-spined lizard, and that refers to the tall neural spines. It probably had a ridge of muscles on its neck, back, and hips. And it was a very large carnivorous theropod. The largest known Acrocanthosaurus, the individual, was about 36 to 38 feet long, or 11 to 11 and a half meters, and it weighed about 4.9 to 7.3 tons. That's pretty big. Mm-hmm. This subadult, aka USNM 466054. Catchy. Yeah. Is smaller. But it is the, quote, most complete theropod specimen recovered from the Arendelle Clay or Maryland, USA, end quote. It's estimated to weigh about 450 pounds or 204 kilograms. Oh, wow. That is much less or less than a quarter ton. Yes. Compared to the much larger one in the study, I, I said that in tons, but that one's about 8,025 pounds or 3,640 kilograms. Oh, so still not even close to the biggest one. Yeah. Karen Oates said that this is, quote, almost certainly an overestimate, though, end quote, because they're missing some fossils that make it just hard to tell. 
So it probably didn't get to 450 or 204 kilograms. Mm. 450 pounds, that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny that it was even smaller. But even if that is an overestimate, this estimate is smaller than the next smallest known acrocanthosaurus, which is estimated to weigh about 1,107 pounds or 502 kilograms. Still small compared to the really big adults, but a thousand pound animal. Mm. <laughs> it's funny to call that small. Well, small compared to its fellow acrocanthosaurus. Yeah. At first, they thought that this subadult acrocanthosaurus was an ornithomimid or ornithomimosaur, but this study finds it to be acrocanthosaurus. Fossils found include vertebrae, part of the right femur, the thigh bone, part of the left tibia, the shin bone, part of the feet, and fragments of more vertebrae and limbs. It's possible this is a new species of Acrocanthosaurus, but there's just not enough fossils to tell for sure. Some other theropod bones have been found in the same area. They've been referred to as some sort of species of Acrocanthosaurus, or CF, Acrocanthosaurus SP, where it's unclear what species. <laughs> yeah, they're just like, we think it's an Acrocanthosaurus. Mm -hmm. Don't know the species. That's because most of those bones are isolated teeth. Oh, yeah. Fewer than 100 theropod specimens have been found in that area, and it's often just teeth or fragments. So mostly we just know right now that it belongs to some sort of theropod. But maybe if another paper comes out about the potential Acrocanthosaurus bone found last year, that could help clear some things up. Now, this subadult lived in a humid, swampy environment that's different from other places that Acrocanthosaurus has been found, which have been described as, quote, evaporitic lake settings, end quote. Though with modern animals like lions, you can see how they've lived in multiple types of places like savanna, desert, wetland. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Don't necessarily have to just specialize in one very specific <laughs> ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You can move around and live in different places. I do wonder whenever I see comparisons to big cats, it reminds me of when we heard how weird big cats are. And yeah. So it's hard to do comparisons with them. <laughs> yeah. It is a big advantage of just amniotes in general, like everything that lays an egg or raises a baby, you know, viviparity as an embryo inside the animal is that you don't have to stay in one very specific environment because a lot of that being tied to an environment has to do with if you're like an amphibian and you have this sort of wet, soft thing that you lay <laughs> and has to be in a very specific environment in order to survive. If your offspring have to be there, it sort of ties you to that place. Mm -hmm. But if you're like a dinosaur and you lay a hard shelled egg, you can go around and it can be a little drier out and the egg won't necessarily completely dry out or it can be more humid and it'll only let in so much moisture. So yeah, it definitely makes sense that they could get around a little more. So we'll keep an eye out about that other acro potential Acrocanthosaurus find. It'd be exciting if it's another species. Yeah. I've always liked Acrocanthosaurus because it's sort of one of the really big non-T-Rex dinosaurs from the Cretaceous. Mm -hmm. And it's also in a, a different part of the family tree because it's a Carcharodontosaurid. So that includes Carcharodontosaurus, but it's in North America. So it's a little bit closer to T-Rex in that way. And it also makes it an Allosauroid. So it's in the, the sort of same group that Allosaurus was in, except it was much bigger. Yeah. We talked about Acrocanthosaurus back in episode 35 as the dinosaur of the day. I like it. I always think about the display at the North Carolina Museum of Science. <laughs> I always forget this in Acrocanthosaurus where it's, there's a sauropod that's sort of half chewed on and is bleeding and really unhappy. Mm. And then I guess across from that is the Acrocanthosaurus looking at it. Yep. The terror of the South. Sometimes it's been called. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. I don't yeah. know if that applies now that we know more about it coming from Maryland. Yeah, and that we now have T-Rex or, you know, Tyrannosaurs from the south. Mm -hmm. so they're a lot more overlapped than we thought before. Although they might be different species, of course. It's hard to say with the amount of Acrocanthosaurus stuff we have from the north and the amount of T-Rex stuff or Tyrannosaurus stuff we have from the south. It's like you get the fragmentary Tyrannosaurs in the south and the full ones in the north and it's the exact opposite for Acrocanthosaurus. So it makes it hard to compare how they overlap. Although I should point out, Acrocanthosaurus was around about, what, 50 million years almost before T-Rex. Mm. So it's not like they had an opportunity to run into each other, even if they were in the same 
places because they were so far apart in time. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Acrocanthosaurus is cool. It also has those taller spines going down its back, which makes it look bigger in some ways, more ferocious, but its head obviously smaller. They were both, Tyrannosaurus and Acrocanthosaurus were both probably the apex predators of their time. So they might not have gotten along if they did live around the same time. They probably would have avoided each other, honestly. Mm -hmm. And they, I'm guessing because it, it's an allosauroid and it doesn't have that same huge head for bone crushing force, it would have had sharper teeth. It probably would have ate different prey and or scavenged to different things. So yeah, they probably would have stayed out of each other's way. And like you were saying, there might be different places that they lived, even if they could live in a wide variety of places. Maybe one of them would have spent more time in like a forest type area. One of them might have been more in the open. You just don't know. But by size and weight, they were fairly close, surprisingly close, at least for the biggest ones. We mentioned the Museum of North Carolina. And there's news on the Yale Peabody Museum that's reopening this spring. Nice. Yeah, it's been closed for a while for all the renovations. Of course, it's going to include the refurbished and reposed brontosaurus and stegosaurus skeletons. I thought you said they, in their announcement they're still calling it brontosaurus? I think so. We can find out in the spring. Yeah, that might be the thing I'm most excited to see. I want to visit at some point to see Rudolph Zallinger's The Age of Dinosaurs mural. Yeah, I remember when we interviewed Mariana and we talked about that mural and how they had to protect it. And it was so challenging because they wanted to keep all the dust off it, but also keep it climate controlled. So they sort of built a giant tent around it and had like airflow and <laughs> its own special HVAC system just for the mural because it was so important. Yes, that's Mariana Di Giacomo, paleontologist and natural history conservator at the Yale Peabody Museum. We interviewed her back in episode 338. So you can tell this has been going on for a while. Mm -hmm. So that was 150 episodes ago about, which means <laughs> about three years. <laughs> and I think it had already been in the works. Yeah. They're also going to have Deinonychus, Hesperornis, Lambiosaurus, that's a skull that Charles Sternberg collected in 1919 from the Oldman Formation in Alberta, Canada. And Poposaurus, a Pseudosuchian archosaur from the late Triassic that it looked like a theropod. It was thought to be a dinosaur for a while, but it's more closely related to crocodilians. It did walk on two legs, though. One of those early Pseudosuchians. Mm -hmm. Those are cool. And then, of course, there's going to be a lot of other animals on display. There's going to be three galleries, including one in the Burke Hall that will show the evolution of life on Earth from early ocean life to the Permian-Triassic extinction event to when the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. And fossils on display will show which are fossils and which parts were reconstructed, which I always like seeing that in museums. Yes. Yeah, that's, I think, a really important piece of museums when they can do that, showing the distinction of this is the part that we had to interpret versus this is the part that we found in the rock. I think it actually kind of makes it more impressive <laughs> than just assuming that the entire thing got dug up and then mounted in front of you. Oh, if only it were that easy, especially if it was just to brush the dirt off the rock mm -hmm. <laughs> version that we sometimes see. But it's always nice when you get that recreation. In some of the very earliest recreations, they did such a good job of camouflaging what was the original bone and what was recreated later that it wasn't until we had things like CT scans that we could piece together, oh, that has a different density and therefore is probably recreated versus this part's probably real rock. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm excited. I don't know when we'll be able to visit, but I'm sure some of you will visit and hopefully share pictures with us. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely one of the most important dinosaur museums in the country, if not the world, because so much of the Bone Wars collection ended up at the Yale Peabody Museum mm -hmm. with, was it O.C. Marsh's uncle was Peabody? Yes. I just double checked. Oh, good. <laughs> That's I why knew it's the Peabody Museum. I knew it was O.C. Marsh and his uncle. So that makes sense. It's Peabody. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that museum reopening. Maybe we will finally make it there once it's open because we missed it all these years. Oops. And in just a moment, we'll get on to our dinosaur of the day, Chow Yang Saurus. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. 
And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Chow Yangsaurus, which was a request from Rory via our Patreon and Discord. And Rory was using allowance to request this dinosaur of the day, so thank you. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. Chow Yangsaurus was a basal ceratopsian that lived in the late Jurassic in what is now Liaoning Province, China, in the Tuchengzi Formation. And Chow Yangsaurus helped show that ceratopsians go back to the Jurassic before the earliest known ones were from the early Cretaceous. Chow Yangsaurus looked a bit like Cetacosaurus, but with a longer face. It was small, it walked on two legs, and it had quills on the tail. And of course it had that rostral bone, which gives it a parrot-like beak, and that's what makes it a ceratopsian. We talked about that in our Celebration of Ceratopsians episode, episode 450. The beak. It's all in the beak. Who to thunk it? Nothing to do with frills. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that it has something to do with frills, but yeah. Mm. Well, Chow Yangsaurus was estimated to be about 3.3 feet or one meter long and weigh about 13 pounds or six kilograms. It's quite a departure from the other dinosaurs we've talked about in this episode. Yes, and a departure from a lot of ceratopsians whose one horn can be about that big and that heavy. (laughs) Well, it's an early one. (laughs) Its skull was about five and a half inches or 14 centimeters long. It did have a couple of cheekbones. And it was herbivorous. It had tightly packed cheek teeth. Its lower jaw was similar to cetacosaurs, and it also had some similarities to heterodontosaurids. But it did have five specific unique features, which is why it got its own name, including the jugal bone on the cheek has a smooth surface on the boss. It's part of the family Chaoyangsauridae, which are some of the earliest known marginocephalians. That's a clade that includes Pachycephalosauria and Ceratopsia. And this family was more basal than Cetacosaurus and Neoceratopsians, and they include Chaoyangsaurus, Xuanhua Ceratops, Yinglong, Juanlian ceratops, and stenopelix. This family had small frills and sharp beaks. Going back to Chaoyangsaurus, the type species is Chaoyangsaurus young eye. The fossils were found in 1976 by Cheng Zhengwu near Chaoyang. The holotype is an adult, and it's a partial skeleton with a skull, and it includes the brain case, lower jaws, neck bones, right shoulder blade, and right upper arm. The dinosaur was mentioned in multiple places before being officially named, which means for a while it was a nomina nuda, a naked name, because there are rules you have to follow with being officially named. Mm -hmm. The first time it was mentioned was in a guidebook to a museum exhibit, and it was written as Chaoyungasaurus. Yeah, okay. I thought there was a go in the middle of it because I was thinking, I actually Googled this when I saw that you were doing Chaoyangsaurus, and I was like, is there a different dinosaur that's Chow Yangosaurus? Nope. But it just redirected me to Chow Yangsaurus, and I was like, okay, I guess I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's just gone through a few iterations. Yeah. Because we started with Chow Yangosaurus, but then in 1983, Zhao Shijin mentioned Chow Yangosaurus. Okay, that's where it is. But didn't describe it, so that was a nomum nudum. It also got mentioned in a paper that wasn't published, and in 1992, it was in a book about Chinese dinosaurs where Dong spelled it as Chow Yangosaurus. But again, no formal description, so that still meant it was a nomum nudum. It definitely got in the zeitgeist after those books, though, because I've, I've heard people talking about Chow Yangosaurus and drawings and things of it mm-hmm. after that point. Yeah, and then it got officially named in 1999 when Zhao Shijin, Cheng Zhengwu, and Xu Xing described the dinosaur. And from that point on, it was just Chow Yangsaurus without the go in the middle. Yes. And the genus name means Chow Yang lizard. The species name is in honor of paleontologist C.C. Young, the founder of Chinese vertebrate paleontology. Chow Yangsaurus lived in an arid climate, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place included pterosaurs and small theropods. And now for our fun fact. I took over the fun fact this week. I know, I was all thrown off. (laughs) (laughs) My fun fact is that some animals shrink over time. Oh, okay. This is why some animals are small? Yes. And by over time, I mean evolutionary time. Yeah, there aren't animals that are born big and get smaller as they age, (laughs) as far as I know. Well, we humans grow and then we reach a certain point where we start shrinking. So there's that. (laughs) That's true. 
<laughs> so part of the re- the reason some animals shrink over time is the ravages of time. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're not talking about that. <laughs> okay, we're talking about a paper by Siobhan Lalroy and others that was published in Communications Biology, and it's open access. And they talk all about Cope's rule. Mm-hmm. So some animals or animal groups like horses, and we'll throw in there dinosaurs, they got bigger over time. Though in some cases, like with dinosaurs, gigantism evolved multiple times. And scientists noticed this it sounded like first in mammals. Certain animal groups got larger over thousands and millions of years, and that became known as Cope's rule. And yes, Edward Cope. He's the one who gets the credit for noticing this. Oh, we managed to mention both Marsh and Cope in this episode. Yeah, good job, us. <laughs> Cope's not the only one who noticed this pattern, though. Charles Deperay and Theodore Eimer had talked about it, for example. It's sometimes known as Deperay's rule, since he was more explicit and clear about it, but he published on it like two decades later. Bernhard Wrench coined the term Cope's rule in 1948. And again, that's that animals got bigger over time. And Cope's rule has some advantages. Larger animals, if you're larger, it means it's easier to go for prey. It's also easier to avoid predators. It's easier to maintain metabolism, fight competitors, withstand starvation, and more. But there's been evidence both for and against Cope's rule. On the again side, that includes, if you look at Alaskan horses, they lived in the Pleistocene and they were medium to small sized. Cryptodiron turtles, that includes most modern turtles, and island lizards, all of these have shrunk over time, as an example. Mm -hmm. So why do some animals shrink over time? Well, the team used computer models to simulate evolution, and they found three patterns, and only two of them support Cope's rule. The first pattern is that animals do gradually increase in body size over time. This happens when there is less direct competition for food and shelter, so the competition becomes mostly about body size. You see this, for example, invertebrates gradually got bigger over millions of years. Oh, that's interesting. It makes sense for the intraspecific. A lot of times we're thinking about how they interact with other species, Mm -hmm. but within the species, a lot of times size is a signal of strength and virility and stuff like that. So you can imagine how there would be a pressure to be bigger and more impressive. Yes. Then there's the second pattern that animals got bigger after extinction events. The largest animals go extinct in those extinction events. So then the smaller animals have the opportunity to get bigger. (laughs) I say it resets. Yeah, resets. (laughs) I mean, we see this with mammals after the dinosaurs. Yeah. Or dinosaurs from the Triassic to Cretaceous. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, because mass extinctions tend to be the hardest on the large apex predators. And we've talked about this in a few of our I Know Paleo episodes. Then there's the third pattern that some animals get smaller over time. And this happens when there's a lot of competition for food and shelter and animals are sharing habitats and resources. And over time, animals, they spread out and they adapt and they get smaller. And the authors call this the recurrent inverse Cope's rule. (laughs) Recurrent inverse Cope's rule. Yes. So it's not just the inverse Cope's rule, it's the one that happens a bunch of times. Yes, (laughs) because we see it a bunch. And the example is the Alaskan horses. They lived in the Ice Age, and then they shrank quickly because of changes in climate and vegetation. Does that make Cope's rule more of a rule because it has an exception? It's like that the exception (laughs) proves the rule. (laughs) I don't know. I'm not the one who makes the rules. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, that explains why some animals shrink over time. And now you know. Yep. It makes sense if you're competing for limited resources that being huge would be a disadvantage. One of these days, I want to dig into sizes more around dinosaurs, Mm -hmm. how they got so big. Yeah. There's a lot of question marks there, though. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem when all we have left is their bones. Yeah. Yeah. It would be fun to do, though. We'll see. Well, that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned next week. We will be talking about, among other things, Tyrannosaur gut contents. <laughs> I love talking about gut contents. Mm-hmm. We got gut contents in an upcoming episode of I Know Paleo, too. Yes. For ammonites. Ooh. You know that ammonites can have gut contents? It doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want more dino goodness, then head over to inodino.com. That's where we have our show notes and links to sources from this episode. Thanks again, and until next time. Good